Oh, good. Well, how do you like the website? Is that, is that not cool? Okay, I can see you're really enthused. <laughs> well, I thought it was fun. That's what we did this weekend, messing around with that. <clears throat> I also had another triumph this weekend. This was the, the Pinewood Derby weekend, and if those of you who are former Cub Scouts know, this is like the climax of your, your Cub Scout career. And I have two boys in Cub Scouts. One is a little wolf, and one is a, a uh, <laughs> he is a wolf too, and one is a Weebelos. And <clears throat> the Weebelos Scout, Johannes, won first in the entire pack. Applause, applause. Thank you, thank you. I should, I should have had his car here so I could uh, show it to you. Was a, um, a great. This is actually, you know, the kids kind of come and uh, watch and cheer, but really, this is the parents, the fathers, actually, <laughs> they're in the competition. So we won. <laughs> and, and the other one, the other one, the uh, little wolf, won best of show for a race car that he he developed that looked like a whale. In fact, it looked a lot like a whale. <laughs> it had a tail. You know, it's supposed to have a spoiler, but it had fin. You know, it was a tail, and a mouth and eyes, and it was kind of going at you. Anyway, it was his. He didn't quite grasp the idea of car. I don't think. <laughs> All right. Well, and we are going to go on with concrete. Um, wrap it up with today's lecture, and uh, I don't know what we'll do on Friday. Something entertaining. But uh, next Monday is the, another test. I mean, I was kind of surprised. I looked at the, the schedule and thought, oh my goodness, is that really good? Well, so you can think about that this week. And what else? Oh, project, yeah, the tower reports um, are also due. So you want to get that together. Hopefully you can, it would be real nice to try to clip a uh, still frame out of your um, video, although the videos next year, Michael, we're going to have to, well, you're not going to be here, Chig, if you do this, we got to have a bit better resolution. That was so, they're so small, but, but, uh, yeah, 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 we'll have to remember that to somehow practice the resolution, but, uh, but I think they're good enough. You can, you can still see, I looked at a couple of them. What's probably hard to do is, is get that frame just with the, if, if you go across the street, they have uh, a little bit better software that you could use. I don't think we have, do we have Macs here that would read the, uh, um, what's that? Film, not Filmmaker, or is it Filmmaker? Oh, shoot. What's, it, what's the production thing for the Mac? Final Cut, that's what I was trying to think of. Final Cut. Uh, if you go across the street with and, and put your MOV file into Final Cut in Groundworks, they've got, they've got that over there in Groundworks, I'm certain. Um, you'll have a much easier time of, I mean, you can go through it frame by frame and then cut out the one frame that, you know, has the, the member breaking. And you should, you can see it pretty good considering it's just a 30 frames per second video, um, you can still see it pretty good. But that might be a lot better I don't. Do we have a Mac upstairs with whatever that was on it? No, Final Cut? Uh, yeah, probably not. Do we have a Mac upstairs in the open? We don't in the BT lab, I know. You don't know, okay. <laughs> so um, get, go across the street to Groundworks and you, you might have a better luck with that. Any other suggestions? All right, we're going to turn this in in section. So, I mean, just one copy to one. It doesn't matter what GSI you give it to. It's well, same as the interim report. And it's supposed to include the interim report? Yes. Yeah. So put the, inter the interim report should be an addendum or something in it, an app appendix or something with those comments. So the whole package is all together. All right. Okay, so, um, concrete design. Let's see, I forgot to bring one of these with me. I hope these work. Oh, good. 
This is, this is one of the most interesting uh, procedures. This is, uh, when, I, when I first went through uh, engineering as, a, as an undergraduate, this is what really triggered my interest. This, this pro I think this must have been the first, the first thing I ever did that was cyclic, that was iterative. Everything else, well, with the wood design and the uh, steel design, you get an equation, you plug in the numbers, and the answer comes out. I mean, okay, there's a certain reward in that, but it's not quite. This, you, you get an equation, you plug in the answers, and you get closer to the answer. I mean, you plug in the, the values and you get closer to the answer. You don't get the answer. You've got to then, it, it then recurses. You've got to go from, from here back up to here and then get this, and this goes into here, and you get this, and this goes in, and it's kind of like a never-ending cycle that could go on and on, and, and in deeper and deeper levels of precision that really aren't going to matter because in the end you have to use bars, but it is, it is fascinating. In fact, this is the very first thing I ever programmed structurally, I think, because, uh, or maybe I did a, Actually, I did uh, pre-stress. There's a pre-stress problem in concrete that's even, even harder to, to get the right numbers with. And we had, oh, I'll tell you a story. Uh, not to be too boastful, but this was, this was back in um, early 80s that I was taking this as, as an undergraduate. And at that time, uh, I don't think a PC, this was before the IBM 8088 came out, I think trying to remember. But what was on the market, one of the very early computers was a, a Commodore 64 that anybody could buy. It was, it was, it, it was the whole thing. It was just a key, keyboard, but that was it. That's all there was of it. And you plugged it into your television and uh, you could play games on it or you could do a little bit of basic programming. And I wrote a, a little a cyclic program to, to come up with a, the uh, steel in a pre-stress beam, I think. And, and it had to run, I mean, just to do this little problem, it ran for like uh, overnight. It was a, a several hours. It was like 10 hours to, before it converged and got, got the exact right answer. So in, when you were doing this by hand, you never got the right answer, not precisely. You just kind of get close and, and say that was, that was close enough. And uh, so, so when I turned in my, my assignment as an undergrad, I had... Uh, you know, the, you, you do a first trial like we'll do with this. You do a first trial and it comes back, and you make a second trial and you come back. So then the third one, I had the right, I had the right number. It converged after 10 hours of chugging through this cycle. So I put the exact right answer into like 20 decimal places. <laughs> and, and it came out perfect, you know. <laughs> the, the, uh, I got called into the instructor's office about that. What the? <laughs> How did you do this? I don't know, I just did a lucky guess. I was just, it came out. I don't know. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah, right. It was kind of interesting because the, the guy who did that was really a, a concrete expert. He was on the, the AIC, uh, AIC 318 uh, committee that wrote the code, and, but he had no, con no um, computer experience. He was a, strictly a, a traditional slide rule and and I mean, he did have a hand calculator, which was mounted on, on the little thing on his desk, you know, like, a, like it was a, I don't know. Anyway, okay. Um, he's still teaching, too, I think. Uh, let's see. Let's go through this process, because it is pretty, pretty amazing. This is the designing a beam. Uh, to design, in, in design with the concrete, there, the reason that it is challenging, the reason that you have to go through these cycles, the reason that it's more than just, you know, steel and wood, I mean, the way they work, is because there are so many variables. You have, I mean, if I'm going to design this beam, okay, variable one, I've, I've got the dimensions of it. Uh, I've got this, this width, and I've got actually two dimensions here. I've got the, the D, which is... Uh, down to the steel, I also have a dimension H, which impacts the dead weight of it, which is the, the full height of it. 
So the, the dimensions of it are a little more complex because structurally the dimensions change depending where, where this is placed. Then you also have, you have this as a variable, the, the uh, amount of, of steel that's in there. You also have the grade of steel as a variable. What, or let's see, what do they call it, FS maybe? It's not called FY. The, the grade, because there could be a, different, a couple of different grades, grade 40 or grade 60 or 75. So that's a variable. Then you've got also the grade of the concrete, for heaven's sakes. Uh, so this has got a, uh, a grade in it. So there are a lot of, I'm probably missing one somewhere, but there are a lot of variables. I mean, compare that, <laughs> compare that with, with steel. And OK, steel, maybe you have a choice of two grades, but probably you just you decide one to begin with. When you pick a, a section, all the properties come, it's a standard section, all the properties come with it. So there really aren't very many variables, and they can pretty easily be combined. You're, I mean, it, your section, I guess, is the only variable you're looking for. The, and the section is defined by, uh, in terms of design, by S, the section modulus. So you pick a section modulus, you pick a section that matches it. Okay, you may have a few choices, but huh, that's it? This, I mean, this is like, this is like, I don't know, breaking, baking uh, brownies or something. There are ingredients that go into this, for heaven's sakes. And, and you have to, you have to have, there's a little bit of finesse. There's, there's design. I mean, you don't have to make it rectangular. You could pick some other shape, for heaven's sakes. Uh, you can, you know, you have more control than you really want over the thing. Um, so that makes it a little more, a little more uh, difficult in the end. Uh, what usually happens is, is you, have to, you have to limit some of those variables. You have to make uh, uh, design decisions at the outset and limit the number of, of variables. Maybe you, you pick the grade of concrete and you pick the grade of steel. And, and very likely you might pick the dimensions of the beam uh, because they may match up, uh, like we said, with other, you know, say if you were doing a... Uh, a building, you may have all the beams the same size so you can standardize on form work. And then really the only thing, okay, if you do all that, then maybe you'll, the only thing you're designing is, only variable you have is, is uh, AS. So that, I mean, that kind of, sim I think that's the way the one on the online is. That kind of simplifies it a little bit. But, but sometimes it may be um, that you are picking some of these dimensions. Maybe you do pick the width or you do, do go into the height. So, so there, there, are other, uh, there are other scenarios. So there are different procedures depending on, on what exactly you want to design that you could go through this with. The other thing that's interesting that you could keep in mind, this dimension D that is pretty important comes up as part of the moment arm. See this, this part right here is the moment arm. Um, that, can, that can vary during the, during the problem. Even if, you, even if you set the dimensions here, of the beam, your D might change as you as you uh, go through the, the the design process. Why you say? How can this be? Well, because this is this is to the center of gravity of the bars, right? Well, if I increase A S, I'm going to have to increase the number of bars. Well, remember there is a a little other steel in here. The stirrups are in here, so it can get kind of crowded. You can fill up the bottom row, and, and then if you still need more steel, you're going to have to put it up here. Whoa! If you do that, then the center of gravity moves. Then D changes, right? So, so it, is, it is a fascinating thing, don't you think? I mean, it can be very complex, uh, depending on what you make out of it. Anyway, uh, so, I, probably in the problems that you do, the, the D will stay, I mean, it'll stay in one. I should have looked at that online problem. Did you look at it? Yeah? Does it all stay in the bottom layer? Yes. You didn't work every one of them? Yeah, see, it's hard to say categorically because I can look at one example and then I can't remember. Well, maybe one will crop up that has more. But hopefully, they'll all, it'll be a little simpler because otherwise you have to calculate the centroid of, of, of that uh, bar pattern uh, to get D. Which is not a big deal, but still. 
another extra step. So uh, looking at how this works out, if we, if we want to, um, let's see. Here, here we have an example where we're just looking for the area of steel. So that means we're going to have all the dimensions defined already. We also have the load condition defined, right? Um, presumably, it's got, got something. And from that, you get your, your uh, you calculate your shear, and you calculate your moment, and you get this fellow here, right? The maximum moment. If you put the loads on in terms of, uh, you know, like the 1.4 dead load plus 1. Point, what is it? Seven live load that we're using. These are the gamma, uh, the gamma factored loads. Then this comes out as mu. That will be the. That's where that comes from. That's the design uh, load. So this is the one you're going to. This is the one you're going to design for. That's what. That's what this is about up here. Now, this equation uh, was derived uh, last week that we looked. I mean, we at least looked at those are the. The uh, comes from uh, the relationship of the forces in the in the stress block. I don't know if we're it's really worth it to go back, but you can look back. Oop, that was probably it. Maybe that's it. I oh, no, that's not it. <laughs> well, maybe I won't find it. I think this was it. There it is. Yeah, I guess this is about as close as we get. It's designed. It's derived from the, these numbers that you have C and you or here's C and T, and this is at the the ultimate stress condition. This is at yield stress. This is. Uh, uh, then you can set up equations. These are, this isn't the page I wanted. Shoot, it must have been an earlier one. Where the heck was it? Not there. What? Didn't we have a pa page that had all? Oh, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. This is this is the page I was looking for. This has all the equations. You can uh, look at this page, and and all the relationships. And this this right here, this ACI stress block is where all these equations are coming from. And they're very, very simple. They're, they're only looking at this relationship. They're, they set up these numbers. C is equal to T. And then you just start substituting. OK, that and that are equal to those things. Then you can solve for A. And this is where this, this equation comes from. You can substitute this row value in there. This is simply the, the, the strength moment is simply one of these times the distance between them. The, this is the moment arm, right? This is, is called z. Sometimes I should have labeled it. That distance in there. So t times that, or you can also write it as c times that. Either one will give the same answer. So that's where these equations, then you can see this comes out. Then you can you know, you start substituting. Anyway, that's where, that's where all those equations come from. They're very simple relationships. And this is then the one that's set in terms of the area of steel. So it's got, it's got this value in there. It's got the phi, because this is uh, relating it to strength. And we use mu instead of mn. So that brings the phi into it. Uh, this is the, uh, this would have been with the a, you see it would have been asfy. So that fy comes over here. And this is the moment arm. So it's just rewritten from that moment arm equation. This then is the moment arm. So you've got um, A S M U, what is it? D F Y, and then I'll I'll write it as Z. This thing is the moment arm, and this one you can initially, I mean, to start off the process. See, you don't know. Um, well, I guess you could if we already have the dimensions given. You could. You could get D. Yeah, all right, never mind. Just plug, we do have D given. You could estimate that, but we can, we'll just take it. Oh, no, we, stu we still have to estimate it because we don't know A. Huh. OK. So that's called Z, and that is approximately equal to, say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, point, point 0.9D, I think. Is that what I have on there? 
probably have it up there somewhere. Yeah, there it is, 0.9D, 90% of D. So initially, when you run through this, because see, you don't have A. Initially, as you go through this, at this point, you get the moment. Okay, this moment is going to come in here, but you don't know this, and you don't know this thing. You don't know that. So you make this, you make this estimate, and that'll give you this. Okay, now, yeah, go ahead, put those on. Um, then we have the equation for A. ASFY over 0.85 F prime C D. Okay, now I take this value, right, and it goes into here. I still, I have all these other ones, those are given. This gives me this value, which then I can plug into there, which then I can calculate this more accurately because here I just estimated it. Now this goes back over here. And so you go through a, this becomes, this becomes a cycle. This, this part right here, you iterate, however, yeah, as a cycle until you finally get an AS that you like, right? In the end, you have to, re you, this, this, this is where the, you know, you have to restrain yourself. You could just keep doing it and doing it and doing it, but, but you have to stop because really it, it doesn't have to be that accurate. In the end, you have to pick AS as a certain number of bars. So having AS calculated to five decimal places makes no sense at all because in the end, you're going to have to round it off to something that fits an even number of bars. You're going to have to pull that number out. So you're going to round it up, obviously. You don't want to round it down or then it would be unsafe, but you're going to round it up to an even number of bars. So actually, you only do this maybe two or three times. It, it's, not as, it's not as much fun as it looks. Um, and you come out with an AS. Then you put the AS into, um, oh well, then you have the AS, that's what you want. That's what you're trying to design for is the AS. Then you, then you calculate the uh, number of bars from that. Once you get an exact number of bars, then you, then you have to uh, check the, the max and min, make sure you haven't exceeded uh, those. And you might go back one more time and check your, but you've rounded up, so it really has to be safe. Um, the other things that we probably, that we definitely won't do, <laughs> well, that would be included in this, but we're, we're going to skip for now. There, the, sh the shear um, design, you know, we did do, we did check shear, I think, in the steel and the, and the um, wood. This one, we won't, we won't bother to check it, but if you did do, I mean, what that essentially amounts to is the design of these stirrups, and in terms of design, what that amounts to is the spacing, how closely you space them together, because they're, um, there are only two choices, they're number three or number four bars, so you pick one or the other depending, if you have a high level of shear, you might pick a four. If it's a low shear level, you might pick a three. And then, and then it's just a matter of spacing. And usually spacing, where would you think it would be tight? It, it's not even, it, it, it could be. You could just, you know, six inches all across the beam. But six inches all across the beam might get kind of uh, tiresome after, I mean, the people have to keep putting it in, but also it uh, uh, uses up more steel. Usually you start with a closer spacing like six, and then after so far you go to 12, then so far you go to 18, and then out in the middle you might not have any shear reinforcing at all. The stirrups drop off. They, they actually do change spacing to follow, the, to follow this. You know, here's the shear diagram. This might be the level, this, the concrete might carry a certain amount of shear, the wood carry. The stirrups then pick up what's left over, and you can see after a certain area there'd be no uh, stirrups in here. I think it's, it's like half the strength level that the stirrups actually, that the concrete actually carries. Anyway, uh, and then the final thing that you check would be deflection. Deflection is done the same way. It, you go back to uh, ASD, or, I mean the uh, WSD, the working stress design. Uh, to do that, you have to build a transform section and exactly the same as we did earlier, interestingly enough. 
because deflections is based on those strain relationships, not, not stress. So, okay, here, shut the lights off. Let's run through an example here. Uh, this, is, this is one uh, with a slab design. Uh, we're looking for the area of steel. Uh, we'll also pick up the H, which is, is we can do through a, a simple assumption. We'll set H, for, this is a slab, we'll set it equal to uh, 1 20th of the span. And this is, this is a number that comes from uh, deflection uh, considerations, that you need about that thickness uh, for, a, for stiffness so it isn't too bouncy. So if we, if we start with, take that as kind of a, as an estimate, we'll, we'll assume that we've got here are the loads that are on it, the weight of the slab, uh, pretty heavy live load, there are the concrete um, requirements. This, this is one half row max is kind of a mm, average uh, percentage of steel. So uh, actually, I don't think I use that, but we'll throw that, throw that in there. Um, so step one, we, we want to get this MU, right? That was, that was this, this thing. Here are the loads. Uh, actually, I have to calculate the dead load. This is the, uh, somewhere I calculated it, is slab, slab thickness. This is, how thick is the slab? 11. Uh, so that would, I'm looking at a one foot strip of it, right? So that would be 11 twelfths of 150. Should be uh, 137 and a half. Okay, there's the live load. Those get factored. They each have their separate factors on them, right? And that gives me a total load. This is the, should be labeled WU. Once you factor the loads in concrete, you usually put a U subscript on it so you can keep track of what the heck you're doing. So this would be WU L squared over eight. That gives me the, the target moment. That is gonna come down here then, right? That's, that's this number, what we did there. So now I've got that. Okay, I'm going to start with the AS, these numbers. Here's the moment arm. And here I'm using uh, that 90% D, and it looks like I calculated D. So D, here, turn, turn that on a second. In this case, that D is coming from, this is a, this is a slab, right? And I've got some, some bars spaced at some distance. So this is going to be, I don't know why that one got squished. This is going to be my, my distance at S. That's, that's what I'm actually looking for, that spacing. I think I, did I choose a bar size? I probably, probably kind of guessed at one somewhere. You might not choose it initially, but you have to have some sort of an idea to get the spacing. If I, if I said like a, I think here I'm using a number eight. So this cover down here beneath the bars is, that's the three quarter inch. Is there a point, point 0.75? The full, the full height here I'm taking is 11 inches. And then this, a number eight would be, um, whoops, I guess I didn't use a number eight. Because <laughs> I've got a quarter, I'm looking up there and see I have a quarter. Right, so I'd have to have a, this is a number four bar. Okay, so if I'm using a number four bar, the full height of the, the full thickness of the bar would be uh, four eighths or a half an inch. So this to the center of it then is my quarter inch. So what's left here is D. So I've got, that. that's what that, that's what, this is, this is the 11th, the full height of the slab minus the cover minus half the bar thickness. So that's, that comes out to be whatever it is. Uh, and that uh, times 0.9, I guess, was about nine inches. So I'm saying, well, I'm saying that's the moment arm. And I put that in there for that entire figure. That's the only time, this is just an initial estimate that I use one time. The D I'm going to use, though, the D I'll keep up with. But, um, and you can see if I change this, if I don't end up using a number four bar, then I'll have to come back and change this. Uh, also part of the interest. 
So we get, we get this number. This is an estimate of the amount of steel per foot. This is square inches per foot. So somewhere I'm, I'm looking at an imaginative foot, right? And I don't really know how many bars might be in that foot, but this is the 12-inch the strip I'm looking at. And this steel, whatever is in here, at its whatever spacing, that's the, that's the AS. OK. So we plug that number down into here. There it is, FY. And we get 1.05. 1.05 is A, right? A is, if we look at the, the stress block, is Oops, there's the base of the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm trying to do this nicely here. Okay, here's the, uh, whoops, intention, let's show it the other way. There's C, which is ASFY. Here is um, <coughs> man, okay, sorry, T, this is C. Um, and uh, 0.85 F prime C B A, and A is this distance, right? The stress block, right? That one. And the neutral axis is somewhere below it, right? Is at C. So, okay, so that's only a half an inch. Uh, I mean, a, a, an inch. It's not nearly what I drew to scale there. It's only a little bit at the top, but for a slab, that's probably um, reasonable because there's such a uh, lot of concrete. It's so wide. Shoot. Okay, so now we iterate it. Now we take, take that A that we just got, we stick that A into here, we take the, the uh, uh, D that we calculated a minute ago and put that in there, and we get a, an actual calculated moment arm. This will be slightly different and, than the guess that we made a minute ago. Then we get an AS out of that. We put that into here. And we get a new A, and you can see it's pretty darn close. I mean, the other one was an inch, so this, this one came out rather quickly. They won't always converge so quickly, but this one did very quickly. Uh, so that goes back into here, and you calculate a new A. And then you kind of you keep looking at what you had before and what you're getting. Last time I had 0508. Now I've got 507. OK, well, it's done. You're, if you're within two or three decimal places, that's close enough, because then you're going to end up rounding it anyway. In this case, uh, I'm going to choose um, a bar spacing. OK, so I have to get. I want to look at my sp spacing criteria. Let's see, here I set it up in terms of the spacing rather than the, the area. So this is, this is the 507 that I just got per 12 inches. And I'm going to use, if I use a number 4 bar, that has a diameter of 0.02. And I want to know what the spacing is per foot. So that would be, I mean, yeah, per foot, yeah, OK. Anyway, it comes out to uh, 4 inches, 4.7, and you'd have to round down, right? If you're saying, I have to have them at least 4.7, but you'd round it spacing, you'd want to round to an even inch. Because somebody has to physically, in fact, probably not just to an even inch, but even 3 inches or 4 inches or something, because somebody with a tape measure is, is laying that out. Or there may be standard chairs set up to, to um, produce that spacing, so it's not it can't be just anything. You want to round it and round it down. So here, four, four at four, and here I assumed a number four bar. So this is probably what I'd, what I'd be looking at. I could also do it if I wanted to do it with a number eight bar. Okay, this is a this is a number eight bar, uh, quite a bit more area. I could put that in there, uh, and well, it looks like actually no. Here I did it the other way around. This, this I saw, I took a spacing 18 inches on center, which I think is uh, about the maximum spacing for bars in a slab. Uh, and at that spacing, I got that 
uh, required area, which then I rounded up to that bar. So that would be at 18, if I wanted to go with 18 inches, I could, I could do that and use a number eight bar, but then my D would change slightly. But then you could redo it, check it, make sure it was still safe. The minimum for slabs is a little different. It's not that 200 over uh, FY, it's this number here uh, because it, it takes into account uh, thermal um, cracking. It's a little different. So that comes out to that. You could get away with a quarter inch. We have a half inch, so that's good. So that's all there is to that. Pretty straightforward. Now, let's see. Oh, here was a quiz. We used to do quizzes. This is still in here for some reason. What do you think about this? This would make a good uh, test question. You can, okay, all right. What do you think? Can we use this in ultimate strength concrete calculations? Can we use MC over I, this equation? Well, we haven't. I mean, this is WL squared over eight. This is, there's no MC over I here. This is C's and T's and, I mean, we just went through, we just went through these calculations, right? There's no MC over I in any of that. There's no, there's no MC over I in, hey, I don't see it anywhere. It's not, it's just not there. <laughs> so we're not using it, but we've used MC over I for everything else. This is the difference with the, the, the stress design. You, it's not based on this. And the reason is because, because uh, MC over I assumes a, a linear, um, to, to derive I, it was based on linear uh, stress, right? And we don't have linear stress. We have this funny stress diagram over here. So that's why we're not using that at all. That's not in the picture, just so you remember that. Okay, here's another, this is another design approach. Uh, and this time we're going to look for uh, the dimensions. Still have the steel in there too, but also uh, check for the dimensions. Now, this is starting to get a lot of variables. I mean, I could, I could specify that, but probably if you're looking for dimensions, you're still you're probably always looking for the, the area of steel. So if I'm, if I'm taking this approach and I'm going to uh, take the dimensions into account, then I have to do something to limit the number of variables or at least make it a little less complex. And what you, what you can do, what, this is where row comes in very handy because rho kind of pulls these things together in one variable. AS over BD, right? That is rho. So if what you're looking for, AS and BD, you know, rho kind of, that rho is that. It pulls that together. You could design for a rho, or you can, rho uh, also has a range that's uh, very definable over uh, I mean, what, there's a row max, right? And there's a row minimum. The minimum, you can't, can't have less steel than the minimum, 200 over FY. You can't have less than the max, or you can't have more than the maximum, or it's an unsafe theme. And right in the middle is, is probably a good design. You can, there are numbers you can pick for a row, like one half row max, or this is one that comes out of uh, stiffness uh, criterion was used in, in uh, allowable working stress design. Anyway, you can, choose a, you can choose this initially as kind of a target, and it, it uh, makes, makes it then possible to, to work through this without uh, so many variables. It takes, it takes AS out of the equation. If you see, this has had, instead of, we, we take uh, AS over uh, BD, solve uh, equal to rho, solve that for AS and substitute it into the, these, these equations and that puts, that puts rho into the picture and you can then uh, solve it for BD, actually comes out BD squared and you get this equation. So this is the same equations we had before but it's just had, had that substitution made uh, and brings rho into it. Now if you make an assumption uh, for rho, see here's what uh, AS is in terms of rho of course, um, then, you know, if I assume this, I can plug that in here. This I've already calculated from here. These values I know, and the only thing I don't know then are, are these. 
So what you do is you solve for that combined term. And then when you get that uh, to converge, it is, is it iterative? Wait a minute, A is not in this, is it? No, maybe not. OK. Well, when you get that, when you solve for that, then <coughs> uh, you, you simply make a choice and uh, you'll comparative. Uh, B is usually a whole number. D is not. So you might uh, set up a little chart and say a series of Bs, <laughs> like 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, or something arranged that, that's reasonable, and solve for D. And then, and then look at them and make a choice between them. So as an example, this is the way this would work. Here's, here's one. We've got live loads as point loads. The dead load of the beam is a, its own. Well, let's see. No, there must be another weight on here. This is, this is applied dead load. And then there's an additional dead load of the, the beam itself that we're going to look at. So uh, initially, find mu. So we have to factor the loads. Here are the loads being factored 0.7 times that comes out to that. That would then be the point load instead of 20. This is the factored, the gamma factored load. Uh, we have to find the, the dead load. Here's the applied load, which is this, and the beam weight. The beam weight is simply the cross-sectional area, right? The run out of space. Well, there's a lot of space over here. Um, the self self load, right? You take the area in inches squared over 144 times 150, and that's the I mean that's the same uh, weight per foot calculation we did with with wood, um, and that'll give you about that number. You have to obviously make some. Uh, you have to make some estimate of A, right? Because we're finding, we're, we're looking for B and D, uh, so we don't really know the area. But you put some number in there. Somehow I came up with 0.6 uh, as an approximate size. So this one might have to be corrected at the end. Um, OK, so then we, we've got the load. We can then calculate. This is, this is two equations. P, P A is the point load. Uh, for moment point load equation, WL squared over 8 is a distributed load. So we got two different equations uh, with the different factored loads. And we get, that's the moment then in kip feet. This is going to be our target row, apparently, 0.009. Just take that as, a, as an estimate. We plug the numbers in here. There's the moment. This has now been converted to uh, inch Oops, sorry, inch kips. This is in kip. They have to match down here. This is KSI, so this is inch kips. Uh, this is KSI. See, I've changed this one into KSI. This is usually PSI, 3,000, but you want to get them all into the same units. So they're all in, this is all in inches and kips. And you just run the numbers, and you come out with, with that. And that then is this combined, this combined factor. And then you pick some sizes to try to give yourself a reasonable dimension. Remember, this is D, not H. So this one, these H would come out to be probably also an even whole number. If you're going to make the forms, you might as well have convenient numbers. But D, it doesn't matter what D is. That's just whatever it turns out to be. Uh, actually, it's whatever's dictated by the cover and the bar, and, the, you know, and it comes out to be some number. And you just have to make sure that it's uh, big enough to be strong enough, because it is the moment arm then eventually, or time minus the um, half the stress block. So here I'm picking a range, and I'm getting this. This this ratio is maybe one to two, one to three. I mean, you've seen concrete. Look at beams around here; they're about like that, right? They're not they're not like ten feet by six inches. No, no, no. That would be way too thin. I mean, they also have a problem with stability. But more than usually, stability is not so much a problem with concrete. The problem is you've got to fit the steel in the bottom. They've got to be wide enough to get the steel in the bottom. And if you start putting it in two rows, well, OK. If you start putting it in three rows, as you, as you put more and more in there, if I had to, 
if I had, you know, made my beam so narrow that I, I had to stack the, the steel like this. Whoa, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you doing? Because this then, here's the, you're, you're, you're killing your D. Your D gets smaller and smaller, right? That means you're losing more and more strength. Uh, it's like a, the dog's not only chasing his tail, he's eating his tail for heaven's sakes. So, so you don't want to do that. Um, so you have to make it wide enough so you don't get too much, too many layers in there. And, you know, too many is just, you know, it's just an amount of what's reasonable, I guess. It's not, usually two or three uh, work out, but, uh, you know, there are extremes in any case, I guess. So, so as a result of that, like two to one, two to one, or three to one, something like that. Okay, so you pick one of here, here, what, I forget which one I picked in this example, probably the bottom one. Yeah, okay, I picked the bottom one, the 18, 18 inch, um, oh wait, 34, go back, which one did I get? Yeah, that's, that's, this is, Oh, remember this, is, you've got to increase for H to get the dead weight. Maybe I did, uh, I'm not sure which I picked there. This looks like 18, 18 by, uh, okay, whatever. This should have been one of them, but I don't, right off, I think that may be a mistake because I don't see the, this looks like the width. And that was the wrong depth, though, 34. It should, maybe they wrote it as 40. It should have been 43, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Whatever. This should be the, the area of it. This should be then the, the total weight. It, it came out. This is, we guessed 6 initially. This is, I mean, 0. 0.6 kips. Well, yeah, 0. 0.6 kips. This is 0. 0.69, so I guess that was okay. Close enough. I didn't want to rework it. But you probably, probably would if it were not too close. Uh, this is then the, uh, checks the, the row. Okay, here's, um, point 0.9, ASBD. Uh, okay, this was the row I had. Here I calculate, oh, I'm, I'm taking that to get the area. Okay, I use this row uh, and calculate the amount of area that would come out of that. To, to match the uh, B and D that I chose. So there's 1834 that should have been in the chart. This is, this is uh, then the area. And then I, all I have to do is, is find out how many bars I need to get that area. You can look at a chart like this. If I'm using number eight bars, here's a bar number eight. And I want to get, what I say, 5.5? There it is. I mean, <laughs> it might not hit it exactly. This one hit it exactly. Exactly, isn't that amazing? Okay, maybe somebody fiddled with the numbers. But there, that comes out as uh, that. Normally, you just have to round up. You'd round up to a, a number of bars, and then you'd have the uh, final step. You have to make sure that it fits in here. You check the spacing requirements and make sure it fits in a, in a row. Well, I didn't get to the last example, which would be non-rectangular analysis. I guess we'll have to do that Friday. But there's not a, um, by mercifully, there's not a computer problem on non-rectangular. So I guess we'll look at that on Friday.